Render ten times faster in cycles using this easy trick. No. Rendering faster in cycles is a matter of building an optimized scene, strategically degrading quality, and troubleshooting renders. In other words, you have to understand how this stuff works. And when you do, you won't need tricks. I will show you how I optimized this render, which is my submission for Clint's staircase competition. It crashed. Every time, it crashed. I made the whole thing on a laptop while traveling, and I pushed it too far. So let's start there. What if you crash? This is a series about optimization. I've explained how to make your file size smaller, open speed faster, and viewport more responsive. The full playlist is in the description. If you can't render, you're likely on a GPU. And you likely feel like this guy doing this. The graphics card has its own memory. In my laptop's case, it's 4 gigabytes, which means that Blender can use no more than 4 gigabytes to render, or it crashes. On Windows, open a task manager with Control shift escape This graph is your VRAM. If it gets to the top and you crash, that's the problem. If not, check this one, that's the RAM. By the way, on Windows, press Windows Control shift b That restarts the GPU and often frees up some memory. Large image textures eat VRAM. 4K, 8K, 16-bit, and 32-bit. In the outliner, the data API view shows every image in the scene and where it is stored. Open them up in an image editor like Photoshop, resize them, and turn down the bit depth. I use an add-on for this. It's called To Optimize Tools. It shows every image in the scene sorted by file size, and one click, and it deletes all duplicates. But the most important feature is the built-in image resizer. Select the worst offenders in the list and press resize. I pulled everything down to 1K, which took 370 megabytes out of my total 430 with one click. The same add-on analyzes every material to see its impact. When you have a heavy material, it's usually because of high detailed noises, bevels, and ambient occlusion. This was fun. I did something I've never had to do before. And I'm so excited because this is how the big studios render. Separate view layers. Think of cutting up the image into different depths and rendering one slice at a time. With this, VRAM is no longer a limit. A bit outside the scope of this video, but badger me in the comments if you want a video. Optimizing the render starts here, not here. The scene itself matters. Outside scenes are quick and inside scenes are slow. Do you know why? Do you know why light objects render faster than emissive materials? It's all in how a path tracer works, and I won't get into that. But I promise if you learn it yourself, you won't need tips. That said, here are five tips. Check that all the normals are blue. Bad normals can ruin a render, not this one, uh, this one. For interiors, try to open up a wall. I deleted the whole ceiling. This is my render, and here without fog. It's just not as cool. But fog takes a million years to render, so... Is there a viable alternative? Kinda. Let's break it down. Cycles renders two volume passes, direct and indirect. Direct has the light rays, indirect has the ambient haze. Blur the image and mix in a mist pass, and mix it over itself. That's not too bad. Render the scene in Eevee, and output a volume pass. So get that into the mix, and we have something workable. As a rule, you can substitute quality for render speed. But you can pull down quality where quality doesn't matter. Like a background prop can look terrible, but it's fine. Noise threshold. How clean does a pixel get before it's considered done? Here's a cheat sheet for you. What does each threshold look like, and how slow is it? There is an alternative to noise threshold. Scrambling distance. Set scrambling distance to automatic and pull down the slider. There's a huge change in how Cycle samples the scene. It reduces the randomness between samples to improve performance drastically. I do not recommend this for animations, because it often creates flickering between frames. But for stills, this is great. Turn down ray bounces. Each step looks a little worse. You'll have to experiment with these. You know, the denoise boiling. 
To reduce it, use temporal denoising instead. It looks at a series of images and makes transitions smoother. AI upscaling and interpolation. If you can cut the resolution in half, you reduce render time by a factor of 4. And if you render only every other image, you have it. Persistent data keeps some files in RAM from frame to frame. I keep this on and turn it off if I get bugs or need to free up RAM. My math sucks, but here's my thinking. Say one frame renders in 10 minutes. With some work you could cut half a minute. How much time should you spend on that? With 200 frames, you'll save about 100 minutes. It pays to spend some time. And I say all that to justify the insane thing that I'm about to do. Who thinks about loading time, right? Here are all the loading messages from my last render. And here they are in Excel. This column shows the time each thing started. I'm writing a very simple formula here. The next item's time minus the current item's time. That makes for the duration of this item. Let's now sort by duration. At the top now I see things that took the longest. Then I'll have to make a judgement about why they took so long. Maybe the files are heavily compressed, or they're on a slow hard drive, or they're insanely big. How did I get this render log? Well, it comes with my render manager, Flamenco. Flamenco is a free program by Blender for studios. I use it for myself. Here's how it works. When I'm ready to render, I press Submit to Flamenco, and it shows up in the Flamenco queue. I keep working on other things, add more renders to the queue, and when I'm done for the day, I start the Flamenco Worker app. It picks up the first render on the list and starts rendering, and it renders from this text window, so it uses less memory than rendering from Blender would. When it's done, it moves on to the next render. I wake up the next day and everything's rendered. It also gave me the text file for loading times, which I converted to a spreadsheet with a Python script I wrote. You can have it, it's on my Gumroad, free. How do we look at a render to find the sources of noise? I've got every render pass enabled. Excess noise, especially fireflies, usually come from just one bad material or light. To figure out which, I circle the noisy areas using the annotation tool. I have made a new view layer with a white material override, so if the noise is gone in these areas, that means it comes from bad materials. If not, it comes from bad lights. I know that very glossy and bumpy materials often cause noise in the glossy direct and indirect passes. I have this lacquered wood that I have to check. These bright pixels are fireflies. They come from lights that are small, strong and close to a surface. In my case, the torches are obvious suspects. I have three options, make the lights bigger, make them weaker, or move them away from the torch. There is one more option, but it is forbidden. You're messing with light values, which is not okay. You make the image ugly. Often, noise comes from a single light. To isolate the lights, you can use light groups. Make a few groups in the View Layer tab and assign each light to a group in the Lights Object tab. Now it's possible to see what lights make what noise. To begin, I made fun of tutorials that promise a tenfold cut in render time. But if you followed every step, I wouldn't be surprised if you did cut it tenfold. But the point is that you can make much better decisions if you understand how this works, instead of checking boxes people tell you to. Including me. Don't listen to me. Learn it. But listen to me in the next video, which is about the images that you save. And I think it might just blow your mind a little bit.